If we could get everybody to take their seats, we'll get started. For, for those of you standing in the back, there are various seats, including in the front row, that are marked reserved, but they're not reserved anymore. So feel free to come take them. And there are also, I see a handful of free seats on the sides as you come down. So again, feel free to find your seats during uh, these introductory remarks. Let me start off by welcoming all of you uh, to the 2009 uh, Trent Lecture. Uh, obviously, it is now 2010, and not surprisingly, there is a story behind that. Uh, but first, let me tell you um, a few things about uh, the, the Jeffrey M. Trent Lecture in Cancer Research. Uh, Jeff Trent uh, was the founding scientific director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, he came here in 1993 to essentially start a program from scratch. Um, he was recruited here by Francis Collins, who was the previous head of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And part of Francis's recruitment here was being given the ability to start an intramural program focused on genomics research. And Jeff arrived here and from 1993 to 2002 uh, did a spectacular job of leading um, our intramural program and starting it from scratch, building it up, and making it really a, a world-class uh, program in genetics and genomics research. Um, he departed in 2002, and at that time, um, I became the scientific director, and, and one of the first things I did was to establish a lectureship in his name, um, and this is the Jeffrey M. Trent Lecture in Cancer Research. And on the program, if you see, this is now the seventh uh, such lecture, and you can see the impressive group of individuals that have given the previous six, and indeed the seventh, as you will uh, already know and will quickly find out, it's no exception to, to that trend. But there actually are a couple stories I wanted to tell before I turn this over to the individual who's going to introduce this year's lecture. Um, it actually turns out there's three of us you're going to see on this stage. Uh, myself, Eric Green, and uh, next you're going to hear from Kathy Hudson, and then you're going to hear um, from Carol Greider. A, a year ago, if you think back, or roughly a year ago, uh, each of our three lives were a little bit different. Um, at, at, at that time, I was the scientific director of the Institute, now I'm the director of the Institute. Uh, Kathy Hudson was a faculty member at Johns Hopkins, um, involved in a whole uh, series of activities and research programs, and she now finds herself as the chief of staff here at the NIH. And our speaker, as you will hear about, um, was just a world-class researcher uh, and uh, a prominent member of the research community, which is why we invited her uh, at that time, essentially a year ago or so, to come give the seventh Jeff Trent lecture. Uh, as you will hear, and undoubtedly you know, her life has also changed a bit in events that actually have influenced this lecture substantially. It would seem, though, that the three of us, uh, Kathy Hudson, myself, and uh, Carol Greider, and the entire NHGRI, it should be a simple activity to put on a lecture like this, but I will tell you, in all of my years of organizing symposium and lecture, this has been the most challenging one uh, to have happen. And in fact, we weren't even successful at having it happen in 2009. It's taken us all the way to 2010. And why is that? Well, if you carefully look at your program, you will notice that the date on this lecture is Tuesday, September 29th. And that was the original date to have Carol come here and give this lecture. And it seemed like such an innocent date when we selected it. It certainly was good on my calendar, and uh, it was good on Carol's calendar, and that seemed good enough. Um, about a day or two before September 29th, um, uh, we got a call that basically informed us that there was going to be a very, 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 very high-level visitor to the NIH and that Masur Auditorium was essentially not available to us anymore, and it was in our best interest to, to postpone this, uh, this talk. Uh, and we did that. Uh, and originally, that, uh, it was supposed to be a different visitor, not the very, very, very top one, but actually the next one down, and it was supposed to be on September 29th. It turned out it wasn't September 29th that visitor came, uh, but it was actually the next day. Um, but what I did find out and, uh, was that we couldn't have used this auditorium on September 29th because when the President of the United States visits you, uh, about the day before, they just lock the room down. They have dogs in here sniffing and they're making sure that everything's fine with this room. So we got kicked out of this room by the White House, which is understandable. <laughs> and Carol was actually very gracious about this. She completely understood. She said, not a big deal. We'll find another date later in the year. So we innocently, once again, picked a, a nice date happened to be, I think it was December 8th or something like that. It looked good on my calendar. It looked good on Carol's calendar. Um, and uh, off we went, and here we were all set to do this. I didn't feel too bad because at least it was still 2009. 
Uh, you know, but then Carol had to go off and win a Nobel Prize. And that just completely threw everything because she had to go all the way to Sweden that week. Uh, and uh, needless to say, I understood it when she called me this time basically to say, you know what, we're going to have to postpone this again. But the good news is it brings us to today. And um, in the effort of being green, um, we decided not to reprint these programs. So I do apologize for the fact that they don't have today's date on them, but we left it as the September 2009 date. But at least it, uh, it, was a, it seemed like a green thing to do. And more importantly, it sort of is a memento to this story of two cancellations finally being able to have the seminar today. So with that said, um, and that explanation of both how we got here and the, the rich history of this lecture series, I'm now going to turn the podium over to Kathy Hudson, who it turns out has a long connection with the speaker and we'll, we'll introduce her today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Carol Greider to you today. Um, Carol and I have been friends for 25 years. Uh, we first met as graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, when I started graduate school there, she was already there, uh, busily toiling away in Liz Blackburn's lab, and well on her way to her first cell publication. Uh, and this should be inspiring to all the graduate students among you. Um, this is a picture of Carol at the lab bench in 1985, and uh, we worked in a very small department, a couple members of that department are here with us today, um, where the students, the postdocs, and the faculty were a very closely tight-knit group. So you didn't have to, uh, when we had a party, which we did regularly, sometimes two on a weekend, um, or if we were having a student seminar, uh, we didn't really have much email back then, we just posted signs around in the building. And this is a a student seminar sign from a very important presentation uh, that Carol gave, um, asking the important question, how crude do Carol's tetrahymena extracts get during telomere elongation? And there's a couple of uh, features here. Uh, figure A shows uh, uh, Carol's supercoil density, um, and uh, her nickname when we were graduate students was uh, supercoil. And on the, in figure B there, you can see a figure representing uh, what was later to become uh, named telomerase. What you can't read in this slide, but I'd like to read an excerpt for you, is an abstract that her friends, and I think it was Claire, uh, who you'll see photographed later, <clears throat> who wrote this abstract for her upcoming cell paper. And it was titled, Partially Purified Proteinaceous Factors from Tetrahymena Do Nifty Things in Test Tubes. Chromosomes in eukaryotic cells have telomeres. Therefore, telomeres must exist. And given that they exist, they must come from somewhere, especially considering that cells divide and make more chromosomes, needing more telomeres. So do the cells themselves make these so-called telomeres, or do they buy them from yeast, known to be in the business of telomere construction? An allusion to Jack Shostak, who was, uh, shared the Nobel Prize with Carol. Or does God make telomeres? Undoubtedly, God does make telomeres, but he isn't telling how or necessarily even calling them telomeres. And you will have to read God's paper supreme being, forthcoming manuscript, just to find out what telomeres are called. Anyway, if you do the right things, tetrahymena will make telomeres for you in test tubes. The gels look great, and all the controls turned out right. Indeed, they did. So here's another picture of uh, Carol back in the day with a um, ugly but no doubt important gel. Um, and being Carol's friend for a very long time, um, I've been trying to understand the key ingredients for her uh, incredible scientific success. And this is a photograph taken in my backyard uh, in the mid-80s. And you can see Carol pictured there. And you also see pictured there <laughs> one of the key ingredients for scientific success, both friends and beer. And uh, in many pictures that I have of Carol, there's also this interesting book, a dictionary. And <laughs> maybe Carol will explain that to you. Uh, so, uh, sadly, um, Carol started before me and she left well before me at Berkeley. Um, and in 1988, um, Jim Watson had a particularly good idea. He had had good ideas previously, including those uh, associated with the structure of DNA, but he had a really great idea in 1988, which was to bring uh, Carol to Cold Spring Harbor as a fellow, uh, sort of a super postdoc position. So we had to say goodbye to her, but not for long, and we stayed very close uh, in touch. One of the first times that we got together after uh, I left graduate school in 1989 was to go on a bike trip 
um, to Alaska. And uh, this picture shows the route that we took, and I don't know how to get a pointer to work, so I won't. Um, but we biked from Anchorage all the way around that dotted line to Valdez. And uh, on that bike trip, um, I have no pictures of Carol on a bike at all. I have pictures of Claire, who wrote the abstract, and her now husband, Roland, and my now husband, Joe. Um, but I have no pictures of Carol on a bike at all. And the reason is because when we saddled up our bicycles in the morning, Carol was off like a shot. She rode a uh, bicycle like she does her science, uh, fast and furious. And so we uh, only managed to catch up with her uh, in the evenings, again, with that key ingredient, beer. Uh, we finished the bike trip, uh, took a ferry back across uh, from Valdez, um, uh, uh, took a train up to Denali, and uh, tackled um, uh, glacial rivers and uh, bear-infested woods um, and had a really great time together. In the intervening years, uh, Carol and I have shared uh, holidays, we've shared vacations, we've shared uh, raising families together, um, we've been colleagues uh, together at Hopkins. Um, and so, uh, uh, Carol uh, did go from Cold Spring Harbor to Hopkins, where again she rose quickly through the scientific ranks, becoming uh, the Nathan's uh, uh, professor and the chair of the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. So during this time that we've been friends, of course, I've accumulated um, many hundreds of photographs, and uh, Eric wouldn't let me show all of them today. But I did want to show you a couple pictures from Stockholm, where I had the distinct pleasure of being a guest of Carol's um, as she received the Nobel Prize. So this is the uh, uh, auditorium where the Nobel Prizes are given out. And what you can see in the top layer there is a full orchestra that performed during the course of the um, ceremony. Down below um, are the Nobel Committee, uh, and sitting in the front on the right is the uh, Swedish royal family, and in the front on the left are the Nobel laureates um, from this year. If you zoom in, you can see a bust uh, of Alfred Nobel. And you can see that there's the green and white decorating above the stage and along the base of the stage and all over. And it turns out that those are flowers that were cut from an uh, Italian villa where Alfred Nobel vacationed. Um, and the whole uh, room was redolent with the smell of these flowers. And here's Carol uh, receiving uh, her Nobel, uh, having successfully walked, 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 and bowed, bowed, bowed. <laughs> um, so, um, and this is where the dinner was uh, following the Nobel ceremony, and the center table was for the important people, and then on the sides were these tables for less important people, and in fact, those tables on the sides were gradients, and the le less important you were, the further out you were at these tables. <laughs> um, Carol uh, had dinner with the prince, um, the princess of Sweden, that evening. So I'm sure you're dying to know what I wore, <laughs> and what <laughs> and what Gigi wore, and what Jeff wore. <clears throat> um, and so on the Nobel website is in, are instructions about how you should dress. And as you can see here, there's um, very specific instructions about what, what one should wear to the banquet and to the um, ceremony. And one of the options is to wear your national uh, costume. And so we did actually have an opportunity while we were in uh, Stockholm to wear our national costume. <laughs> um, but we did manage to get ourselves uh, cleaned up. And uh, as a girlfriend of mine uh, here at NIH told me when I said I wouldn't be at a meeting the following week because I was going to Stockholm, she said, I have the best girlfriend story ever. My girlfriend won the Nobel Prize. Carol? Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, I'm speechless. Um, I must say I have never, ever had an introduction like that ever before. Between the uh, poster for the uh, talk when I was a graduate student, which basically gave away all of the science, and then the, the history of the rest of uh, what we've been doing recently, I guess I can just stop and ask, are there any questions? <laughs> it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, come back and uh, see you know, so many friends. I have a, a lot of people. I, I come here uh, to the NIH a lot. So I, I really um, appreciate being able to come here for this uh, much postponed um, uh, talk. Um, 
So uh, what I'm going to do today is to uh, give just a little bit of background uh, on uh, telomeres uh, and telomerase. Um, and then uh, I'd like to uh, tell you sort of what we've been doing over the last um, five or six years, and at, at the very end, I'll tell you a little bit of a new story that um, I haven't had a chance to talk about yet. It's always good to be able to uh, come somewhere and actually uh, talk some, uh, some science. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the telomerase uh, history and discovery, uh, just uh, to follow up on uh, Kathy's introduction uh, from the Nobel. I'll tell you um, a very little bit about uh, the role of uh, short telomeres uh, in cancer. Uh, and I'll spend the rest of the time uh, telling you about uh, short telomeres in human genetics uh, and age-related degenerative diseases. Uh, notice the human genetics here for the uh, NHGRI, just to uh, remind you. So uh, telomeres are the very ends of chromosomes. Um, and you can see here, uh, in, in these, uh, these blue tips. Uh, and they provide two really essential functions. One is that they have to protect chromosome ends, uh, so they serve um, as caps to protect the ends from nucleases, uh, from end-to-end uh, -end joining, from various recombination processes. Uh, and the second essential function that they have to do is to maintain uh, telomere length. And the telomeres are uh, made of simple DNA repeats that are bound uh, by specific proteins. Uh, so this is just uh, an illustration um, of the uh, s very simple telomere repeats. Uh, the very end of the chromosome is single-stranded, uh, and telomere repeats in many organisms um, are these simple tandemly repeated sequences, and what's shown here is the uh, human, and in fact all of vertebrates have the sequence TTAGGG repeated over and over again. Uh, you'll also see uh, the repeat uh, TT. GGGG, which is the uh, tetrahymena telomere uh, repeat. So they're very similar uh, conserved repeated sequences. Most of the telomere is double-stranded, uh, although there's a uh, small region uh, that is uh, single-stranded at the very end. In order to provide telomere function, you need not only the telomere repeats, uh, but also uh, the proteins that bind along the length of the DNA. So there are proteins that bind to the double-stranded region and proteins that bind uh, to the single-stranded region um, of the telomere in order to provide this uh, protective function. So it turns out uh, that the way that DNA replication um, occurs, uh, the very end of the chromosome isn't completely replicated. Uh, and so this is what was known uh, in the 1970s. In fact, Jim Watson uh, wrote in a theoretical paper about this problem of replicating the very end um, of the chromosome. And so uh, without any other mechanism, uh, the telomeres would shorten every time cells divide. Um, and so uh, this was uh, posed as a, a particular problem uh, back in the 1970s uh, and early 80s. Um, and so uh, we were just very curious to find out how is it that chromosomes can be maintained if there's this problem uh, that every time the cells divide, they should be getting uh, shorter and shorter. And so um, to, just to set the stage about uh, how people were approaching this, uh, this is um, a paper that was written by uh, Jack Shostak and Liz Blackburn, who were the uh, co-recipients um, of the Nobel Prize uh, this year. <clears throat> and what Jack and Liz did was to find a way uh, to be, look at the function of telomeres. We knew what the telomere looked like in the single-celled organisms uh, called tetrahymena, where the telomere sequence had been uh, clearly delineated, uh, and that was a, uh, the TTGGGG repeats. And so what they did was to take a uh, circular uh, plasmid from yeast that had a marker uh, and to linearize that plasmid, uh, and they put onto the very end telomere sequences from tetrahymena. And when they put this linear plasmid into uh, with the tetrahymena telomeres and they put it into yeast, they found out two remarkable things. First of all, the tetrahymena telomeres functioned as telomeres in yeast, that is, they protected the chromosome end, and this uh, chromosome now uh, divided uh, uh, successfully uh, and was maintained as a linear chromosome. The second thing that they found out uh, in a subsequent uh, follow-up paper uh, with Janice Champay is that after this linear chromosome had been maintained in yeast for a number of divisions, uh, that there was uh, yeast telomeric sequences which were added on to the very termini um, of these tetrahymena repeats. Um, and so uh, that really uh, got their attention. Um, and in order to understand how it is that telomeres are maintained, uh, they made a, um, a very bold hypothesis. Uh, and that is that they wrote uh, in this Nature paper, uh, we propose that terminal transferase-like activities are responsible for extending the three prime end of the GT-rich strand of yeast telomeres. Such activities 
uh, could ad be added as single nucleotides, uh, et cetera. But this was a bold hypothesis because it proposed that there was a completely unknown enzyme that would be elongating telomeres. And there were other hypotheses that involved recombination and other mechanisms uh, whereby uh, telomeres could be elongated. Uh, so uh, when I then uh, joined the Blackburn Laboratory, um, I wanted to be able to test, is there really such uh, a thing? And so uh, we, uh, again, started off with tetrahymena, uh, which is uh, known to be in the business of uh, building uh, telomeres. Uh, and what we did was to use a single-stranded telomeric sequence oligonucleotide primers, shown here as this very uh, small blue arrow, uh, and to put those into uh, extracts of tetrahymena, along with radioactive DGTP uh, and DTTP. And what we found is that uh, the activity in those cell extracts would add the sequence uh, T2G4, T2G4, T2G4 uh, repetitively onto the end of this primer. Um, and it turns out that this uh, telomerase, uh, as we then uh, subsequently uh, named it, uh, is what is responsible for elongating uh, telomeres. And so the very first uh, gel uh, where telomerase was identified uh, is a little bit smeary here, but this is a six-base uh, repeating pattern uh, that was standing, extending up to the top of this uh, sequencing gel. So having identified an enzyme activity which would add these telomeric repeats onto a telomeric substrate, the next question, of course, became, well, where does the information come from? Um, and so uh, we uh, had various debates about it, uh, but what we proposed is that perhaps this telomerase enzyme uh, may contain uh, a template for this sequence within it. Uh, and so sure enough, by following up with various biochemical experiments, uh, we were able to show that there is an RNA component which has uh, the complement of this DNA sequence within the enzyme. And so the telomerase is actually uh, both a protein and an RNA component that allows the synthesis of these uh, telomeric repeats. Uh, so that's illustrated here. You have uh, the telomeric uh, sequence here, and the telomerase enzyme, which is made up of both um, a protein component as well as an essential RNA component, within that RNA component is this complement uh, to the telomeric repeat. So the uh, template region can be used to fill out and then translocate uh, and make many, many copies of this uh, T2 uh, G4 sequence. So we're very fascinated by uh, the telomerase enzyme and how you can have uh, an enzyme uh, carry out this function of having the RNA component um, as part of the enzyme itself. Um, but we also became interested in um, what actually this enzyme may be doing uh, in cells. And so as you heard, um, after uh, leaving uh, the Blackburn Laboratory, I went to uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, where I started to get interested in what was happening um, in uh, human cells uh, at the ends of chromosomes. And very fortunately at that time, uh, there was the, the very beginnings of actually the, uh, the genome meetings that would occur uh, every year uh, at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, and I was fortunate that I was at the meeting where they first identified the human telomeric sequence repeat, because at the time, it wasn't known what the human telomeric sequences were in any organism. Uh, but that was uh, presented um, at a meeting in uh, 1989. Uh, and so uh, we were interested then in doing an experiment to ask what happens in human cells, in normal human cells, uh, to the length of telomeres. Uh, and once we got a hold of the uh, human telomeric sequence, we could do a southern blot. Uh, and what we found was that in um, normal human cells, as you passage them in culture, they normally undergo cellular senescence. Uh, and this is um, a southern blot showing the uh, sort of smear um, of the telomeric repeats because uh, the heterogeneous nature of the length of telomeres. And as those cells are passaged for increasing numbers of doublings, uh, the telomeres are actually uh, shortening. Um, so it turns out that in many primary human cells, telomerase isn't expressed. And so just that same problem I was telling you before, the end replication problem, uh, leads to some telomere shortening. So we got very uh, interested in this. Uh, and this uh, set off a number of proposals about uh, what might happen uh, to cancer cells, which have to divide many times. Uh, and so we uh, sort of started walking down the path of trying to understand uh, the functional consequence uh, of uh, telomere shortening uh, in human cells. So in order to ask uh, critical questions about what would happen uh, in cells uh, that don't have telomerase, we decided to um, use mouse genetics uh, to be able to ask uh, very specific questions. Um, and so uh, to, uh, to do this, we uh, generated a mouse uh, in which one of the two copies um, of telomerase uh, was eliminated. 
So uh, what's illustrated here is uh, the, the name for the gene. This is the mouse telomerase RNA. This is this essential RNA component um, of telomerase. And uh, what Maria Blasco did when she was uh, in the lab is to generate um, a mouse in which one of the two copies of the telomerase RNA uh, was deleted. And when you cross two such mice uh, together, um, what you get, of course, is the wild type, the heterozygote, and the null animals. And these null animals were perfectly normal uh, when they're born in uh, normal Mendelian ratios. But we could show that there was no enzyme activity for telomerase uh, in these, uh, these null animals. So uh, we were then interested in what happens uh, in future generations. And when you take two such null animals, and we call this the G1 for the first generation in the absence of telomerase, uh, and you breed those to each other, you get uh, the G2, the second generation null animals, uh, the G3, G4, G5, et cetera. So uh, these uh, mice were breeding continuously. We didn't see any phenotypes in the early generations. I'll tell you about the phenotypes we did see uh, in the later generations, uh, but first I want to show you uh, what actually happens to the telomeres as these animals are breeding uh, progressively uh, for a number of generations. So in order to follow the telomere length, we use this quantitative analysis um, of telomere length that was developed by Peter Lansdorp. Uh, what's shown here is a metaphase spread um, of mouse chromosomes, where the chromosomes are stained in blue with DAPI, uh, and the telomeres are stained with a uh, PNA probe. Uh, this is a uh, very short oligonucleotide probe, uh, and the number of probes that can hybridize to the telomere is proportional to how long the telomere is. So the signal intensity of each one of these dots uh, is proportional uh, to the length of the telomere. So that you can then follow um, <coughs> the telomere length with increasing generations. Uh, and what you, uh, what you get is when you look at the uh, parents here, these heterozygous mice, uh, there's this nice frequency distribution, uh, this being the telomere length and this being the number of ends that have that length. Uh, and you can see that with increasing generations, uh, there was a progressive uh, shortening uh, of the telomeres uh, in these mice. So uh, telomerase uh, not only uh, will make uh, telomeres uh, in vitro, but it actually is what's essential for maintaining telomeres uh, in the mouse. The other thing that's really nice about this assay is that you're actually looking at the chromosomes. Uh, and what we could see is that uh, not only was telomere length shortening, but the loss of the telomere sequence was leading to loss of telomere function. So if you look here in the wild type metaphase spread, uh, you see these nice uh, mouse metaphase chromosomes, and all mouse chromosomes uh, are telocentric. That is, the centromere is located all the way along one uh, chromosome arm. So you see these nice little boomerangs that look like the mouse chromosomes. When you then look in the G2, the G4, and the G6, uh, what you start to see uh, is some chromosome ends where we don't detect any hybridization. So these are the shortest telomeres in the population, and they've fallen below the level of detectability um, of this uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization assay. But then we saw some chromosomes uh, that look like this. Uh, and those are two telocentric mouse chromosomes that are fused end to end, and it looks like a metacentric uh, chromosome. Uh, but in fact, these are two uh, chromosome fusion events. So in addition to losing telomere sequence, They've also lost telomere function. I told you that the telomeres are essential for protecting chromosomes uh, from such uh, aberrant recombination events. Uh, so there's clearly loss of telomere function. So what actually happens in the, in the mouse? Um, we saw no phenotypes in the early generation mice, uh, but in the later generation mice, what happens is that uh, we see uh, increased apoptosis cell death uh, or cellular senescence. And at the level of the mouse, uh, what that uh, translates into is um, the first thing we could see was a decrease in fertility, and then uh, later on infertility, because the um, uh, testes in the tubules, the germ cells, uh, were undergoing apoptosis. Uh, we also see uh, apoptosis in the um, immune system, uh, in the B and T cells uh, are undergoing apoptosis, and there is a lot of apoptosis uh, in the intestine. So tissues of high turnover that are dividing many times uh, are undergoing apoptosis. So we and many other uh, laboratories are then uh, very interested in how it would be that a short telomere uh, would cause a cell to die. Um, and so in a, a series of experiments I won't really have time to get into, uh, the uh, model that uh, the field really has developed is that uh, short telomeres uh, induce a, a DNA damage response. So if you normally have double-stranded DNA and that DNA undergoes some sort of a break, 
That broken region is recognized by specific proteins, and they will signal through p53, and the cells can undergo either apoptosis or senescence, depending on the cell type. In the case of short telomeres, if you have uh, long telomeres, these are protected. These chromosome ends are protected by those telomere binding proteins I told you about. But when the telomeres get to be too short, they no longer function as telomeres. And they're recognized, uh, again, by um, a particular uh, set of proteins that recognizes this as a short telomere. And this also signals through p53, and the cells undergo uh, apoptosis or senescence. And we're very interested in understanding uh, the components of this pathway uh, that lead short telomeres uh, to induce uh, this apoptosis. We're also very interested in the cellular consequences um, of the short telomeres. So uh, as I've been telling you, the telomerase then is really essential for all kinds of cells that have to divide many times. So uh, one example of that is cancer cells. If you have a particular tissue and one cell undergoes a, a genetic uh, mutation that will allow it to divide many more times than the cells around it, um, you can see that those cells are going to divide relatively many, many more times uh, than the other uh, cells would divide. And um, we were able to show that these cancer cells need to have telomerase in order to be able to continue uh, and divide. The second uh, situation uh, is in uh, stem cells, and these are tissue-specific stem cells, where you have a particular stem cell that has to undergo self-renewal, uh, but also uh, differentiation, uh, and that uh, cell division gives rise to many, many different uh, tissue types uh, to undergo uh, tissue renewal. And it turns out that the telomerase is really uh, essential uh, for this uh, tissue renewal. I'll tell you one uh, story uh, about cancer cells and then focus uh, the rest of the talk here on uh, what happens uh, when you don't have enough telomerase for tissue renewal. So once we had generated a telomerase knockout mouse, uh, we and Ron DePino, with whom we were collaborating, uh, set out to ask uh, what is the role um, of short telomeres in the ability of cancer cells to divide. And so uh, we crossed uh, the telomerase to a number of uh, mouse models of various kinds of uh, cancer. Uh, and this is just a uh, table that summarizes uh, some of those findings. And the effect of short telomeres uh, in these settings was to uh, decrease uh, the rate of growth uh, of those uh, tumor cells. And in some cases, when we could look at the mechanism, uh, it was clear that apoptosis was being uh, increased uh, and that would then decrease uh, the <clears throat> number of times that the cells uh, could divide. So we wanted to follow up on these uh, models that suggested that short telomeres uh, can limit the growth uh, of cancer cells, and we wanted to be able to look at uh, specific mechanisms and the pathway by which the short telomeres may be triggering uh, the cell death. And so David Feldzer, who was a graduate student in the lab, uh, decided to use uh, another model of uh, tumorigenesis, uh, and that's a B-cell lymphoma model in which the uh, emu MIC, uh, sorry, the MIC oncogene was driven by the emu promoter uh, in B-cells. And so what he did was to generate a transgenic uh, emu MIC mouse and put it onto the uh, genetic background with the heterozygous uh, telomerase mutation, and when you breed these together, you can select for the transgenic G1 mice, uh, and then breed those, and always selecting for the transgene, breed the entire uh, line of mice uh, down like this. And then we could ask about the rates of tumor formation uh, in the different uh, lines of mice. And what uh, David saw was uh, really quite striking, and that was that the short telomeres uh, really uh, limit the growth of the tumor cells such they dramatically protect the mice uh, and increase their survival. So what's shown here is the percentage of mice that were um, alive. And if you look at the emu mic uh, mice on their own that are wild type for telomeres, which is shown here in the black line, uh, you can see that the survival um, is significantly decreased, and by 100 days, uh, half of the mice um, have died, and they all have died of this B-cell lymphoma. When he looked at the mice, which were uh, the emu mic transgene and null for telomerase, but the first generation, so these are the long telomere mice now, what he found was there was uh, no change. There was a, a very similar rapid decline. So the B-cell lymphoma is growing very rapidly uh, and will, uh, will kill these mice. However, when you look in the emu mic mice that had the very short telomeres, what you find is that there was a really significant protection 
um, against the B-cell lymphomas. And actually, uh, you can go into these mice and you can look and there are very small microlymphomas that start growing, but then uh, they stop growing. So this, again, uh, makes the point here that uh, it must be not the absence of telomerase, but rather the short telomeres that have to be causing this effect. Because uh, genotypically, these mice are null for telomerase and these mice are null for telomerase. The only difference between this cohort and this one is that these have short telomeres because they've been bred for many generations. Uh, so the conclusion is that it's the short telomeres which are inducing the apoptosis and then limiting uh, the growth of this B-cell lymphoma. One of the nice things about this model, it allows you uh, to have access to the cells that are these uh, pre-B-cell lymphomas to ask a question about pathways. And so what David wanted to test uh, was to ask, um, what happens if you have a short telomere, and we know that that signals through P53, and then the cells undergo apoptosis, what happens if you actually uh, block apoptosis? So he was able to, in this model, overexpress the BCL2 uh, oncogene, which blocks the apoptotic pathway. And quite to our surprise, what we found is that the mice were still protected the short telomere still protected the mice against the B-cell lymphoma, so the cells stopped growing. And David was go able to go on and show that even when you block the apoptosis that comes from P53, uh, that cellular senescence uh, will occur, and this will also limit the tumor growth. Uh, so quite strikingly, the, the telomeres can operate through uh, both of these pathways, senescence uh, and apoptosis, in order to block the growth um, of these tumor cells. So the, the second place where uh, telomeres are really uh, essential in cells that have to divide many times uh, is in this uh, question of tissue renewal. And this really uh, came to the forefront uh, when a paper was published uh, in 2001 by the Dokel Group. Uh, this was a paper published uh, in Nature. Um, and uh, it's entitled, The RNA Component of Telomerase is Mutated in Autosomal Dominant Dyskeratosis Congenita. Okay, so this is um, a group uh, in England who were uh, doing family studies and mapping genes that were involved in this uh, particular inherited uh, human disorder. Uh, and what they found was uh, that in their mapping studies, it was the RNA component uh, which was uh, tracking uh, with the disease in their families. So what is dyskeratosis congenita? So some of the clinical features of dyskeratosis congenita, there are these dermatologic criteria by which uh, the disease uh, gets its name um, of dyskeratosis. There's skin hyperpigmentation, or leukoplakia, uh, and uh, abnormal growth um, of the nails. Uh, but the mortality of the disease uh, was primarily attributed to uh, aplastic anemia or bone marrow failure. Uh, there's also uh, pulmonary fibrosis, as well as increased uh, cancer risk, which would uh, increase the mortality in this disease. And so our hypothesis, uh, given that the human uh, telomerase RNA was implicated here, uh, is that the um, The disease is due to decreased tissue renewal capacity due to the short telomeres. Uh, so we then uh, wanted to ask uh, specific questions um, about this uh, disease model and ask what is the role of the short telomeres uh, in this dyskeratosis congenita. Now there are several modes of inheritance um, of dyskeratosis congenita. Uh, what I was uh, referring to now is this autosomal dominant uh, which was identified by the Dokel group. Previously, the Dokel group uh, had mapped the gene that's uh, encoding the X-linked form of inheritance. Uh, and that gene they called uh, Dyscarin. Uh, and it turns out, very interestingly, that the Dyscarin also has a link uh, to telomerase. So the Dokel group had shown that the RNA component of telomerase, the human telomerase RNA, is mutated. They had shown that Dyscarin is mutated. Um, and in work that uh, we had done biochemically on the telomerase enzyme, uh, we had found uh, that there's this uh, specific stem loop in the telomerase RNA, which is a box HACA uh, binding domain, uh, to which this Dyscarin binds. So it turns out that the X-linked form of the disease, uh, you don't have the Dyscarin binding, you destabilize the telomerase RNA, uh, and you get uh, this uh, effect um, on telomeres. Uh, the Dokel group showed that mutations in the RNA component uh, can lead to uh, uh, dyskeratosis congenita, and I'll show you in a minute that mutations in the protein component of telomerase, which we call TERT for telomerase reverse transcriptase, also lead to dyskeratosis congenita. So uh, we got interested in this uh, when a um, patient came into a clinic uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, with uh, aplastic anemia, and it was apparent that this was a family uh, with dyskeratosis congenita. 
Um, and the previous uh, examples of autosomal dominant were mapped to the telomerase RNA, uh, and Mario Amanios, who at the time was a, a fellow in the lab and now has her own uh, lab at Hopkins, was able to follow this uh, family, which we call Hopkins Family One, uh, and to study the uh, autosomal dominant inheritance um, of this disease uh, within this family. And I want to make a, a couple of points uh, from this particular pedigree. First of all, um, that the, the Dokal group, as well as uh, Mary Omanios, showed that there is a genetic anticipation in this disease. That is, uh, that with each generation, there's an earlier onset and a worsening of phenotypes uh, within this family. Uh, and this uh, should remind you uh, of the telomerase knockout mouse, where we see progressively uh, worse phenotypes uh, in the later generations. The other thing is that the affected people are heterozygous for mutations in either the RNA component or in this particular family, it was the protein component which was mutated. And so as a geneticist, this interested us a lot because if there are heterozygous and it's inherited as an autosomal dominant trait, then that suggests that either there's a dominant negative effect or haploinsufficiency. So it could be uh, that if you have two alleles of telomerase, that the mutant allele is somehow interacting with the wild type allele and taking that out, that that's a dominant negative effect. Or if you have a wild type and a mutant allele, and it's not sufficient to have only wild type function, that's haploinsufficiency. And we realized we were in a situation where we could genetically test this very rigorously using our telomerase knockout mouse. So uh, we set out to um, ask the question about whether or not haploinsufficiency uh, was the mechanism by which this uh, disease uh, uh, function was carried out. And I'll show you that, in fact, um, it is due to haploinsufficiency. So the mouse model that I've been telling you about up to now uh, is the telomerase knockout mouse that's on the C57 black 6 uh, genetic background. And this is a southern blot, a pulse field gel, because mouse telomeres are very, very long. You can see this long heterogeneous smear, which is why we normally quantitate them using this fish assay. Um, however, there are uh, a number of species of mice, and these are all recently derived from the wild, so uh, more wild-type mice. Uh, and you can see that the telomere lengths on these blots are very similar uh, to human telomere lengths. And so uh, what we had done was to cross the telomerase null allele onto this background here of this uh, cast EI, which has uh, human-like uh, telomere lengths. Uh, and we were doing that in order to do uh, various other studies. And we, we recognized that having these mice with the knockout allele on the, uh, th this other genetic background would allow us to test the question of haploinsufficiency. So what we were able to do then is once we had had this now uh, back crossed uh, for seven generations onto the Castaneous background, is to now do a cross like we had done before, but rather than following the null mice for progressive generations, we kept the uh, telomerase heterozygous. So this stands for heterozygous generation one. So these mice are maintained as heterozygotes, heterozygous generation two, heterozygous generation three, generation four, et cetera. Uh, and to ask the question, uh, what happens uh, with the telomere length? And what we found was that there was progressive telomere shortening in the heterozygous state. So what's shown here is this uh, quantitative fish assay. Uh, wild type uh, castaneous is shown uh, here in the, the black bars. This is the signal intensity, and these are the number of ends that have that intensity. Uh, and we're focusing on the lower end of the distribution here, so everything on the upper end is put into this last bin, which is why you see this uh, particularly high bar here, so we can focus on this end of the distribution. Now, when we look at the heterozygous generation one, we see that the telomeres are shorter than wild type, but even more importantly, there's progressive shortening in this telomere length distribution with increasing generations, showing that at the level of the telomere length, clearly haploinsufficiency uh, is, can contribute uh, to this disease. Now, of course, when we're breeding these heterozygous mice, uh, every time you breed and look uh, at the heterozygotes, you, of course, also get uh, the wild, uh, excuse me, you also get uh, the knockout um, at each ge different generation. Uh, and in studying the uh, colony of mice, uh, we were able to find that there's actually um, a decreased survival depending on what generation uh, the knockouts came from. So uh, this is a survival curve, uh, days versus the number of mice alive, and then the wild type uh, you can see that the wild-type colony is, is doing uh, quite well. If you look at knockouts that come from heterozygous generation three parents, uh, they have a slight decrease in survival. Knockouts from heterozygous generation six 
versus heterozygous generation eight is shown here and here. There's a real dramatic decrease in survival uh, in these mice as they are progressively uh, bred when the parents then have shorter and shorter telomeres. So this indicates that the inheritance of short telomeres decreases the survival in these mice, and it resembles the genetic anticipation that's seen in dyskeratosis congenita uh, in this heterozygous state. Now, when we're breeding these mice, we uh, breed the heterozygotes, and we know that the telomeres are shortening progressively. And of course, every time we do this breeding, we get out the knockouts as well as the wild type. Um, and we were very curious to know what happens uh, in these wild type mice uh, when they've inherited short telomeres uh, through many generations. Uh, and what I'll show you is that these mice actually have uh, very short telomeres, even though uh, they're wild type. So again, I'm showing you for reference the wild type, normal wild type telomere lengths and the knockout generation one. I've already shown you here in this green that the heterozygous generation five, sorry, sorry, in the blue, the heterozygous generation five has short telomeres, but surprisingly, uh, the wild type five litter mates also had short telomeres. So here is a cross to heterozygous generation four. We get a knockout, heterozygous generation five, and the wild type five star. And we call this wild type five star because these mice are not actually wild type. And I've been making the point that it's the short telomeres that are causing the disease uh, in these families, that it's not uh, the absence of telomerase per se. And so in this particular setting, uh, telomerase is completely restored to wild type. And so we were uh, very surprised when we then uh, looked at the phenotype in these mice, and we found that there was a significant uh, decrease in the um, testes weight and an increase in aberrant tubules. So uh, these normal wild type mice compared to the wild type four star mice, uh, there was clearly um, a phenotype in these mice. Again, indicating that it's the short telomeres that are causing the effect, even when telomerase is restored to the wild type setting. And so we called this um, genetic disease in the absence of telomerase mutation or a form of occult genetic disease. And this is particularly important because uh, these are the alleles that are normally mutated in the human uh, autosomal dominant inher inherited syndromes. Um, and so this suggests that in families with this disease that there may be people where you can sequence the genes that are contributing to telomere length all you want, uh, but you will find that they are wild type where it's the actual telomeres that are contributing uh, to the disease. Uh, so it's a form of uh, hidden or occult uh, genetic disease. Uh, and we think that this is important uh, to inform in terms of the, uh, the clinical setting uh, where uh, the telomere length may be really the thing that matters. Now, whenever I show this about the wild type telomere lengths uh, being shorter in these wild type stars, uh, people always ask, yeah, but, but what would happen in the normal uh, uh, setting? That is, um, can you ever get these to be back to normal wild type telomere lengths? So we uh, undertook this experiment, which took another uh, three years of mouse breeding. Uh, and what we set out to do is to ask the question about whether the normal wild type length equilibrium could ever be reestablished. So we took these uh, heterozygous mice and crossed them to each other, as I've shown you. And we got out these wild type five star mice uh, that have phenotypes not only in the testes, but as well as the intestine uh, and the uh, immune system. And now we cross these mice uh, to each other to ask for how many generations would you have to cross mice in order to restore uh, the normal genetically determined uh, telomere length. And what we found is that after four generations of breeding, uh, we did in fact restore uh, the normal uh, genetically defined telomere length equilibrium. So uh, here is the heterozygous generation four mouse in red compared to uh, wild type mice in blue. And the wild type five star two, which is two generations of breeding wild type mice to wild type mice, hasn't quite gotten back up to the normal genetically defined equilibrium. But now when we get to wild type five star four, uh, now we have um, overlapping telomere length distributions. Um, so this indicates that um, it's a slow process, that we know that telomerase is limiting in cells. We know telomerase is limiting because having half the level of telomerase isn't sufficient to maintain uh, telomeres in these inherited syndromes. And again, telomerase is limiting and that it takes four generations of breeding with wild type levels of telomerase to reestablish the normal uh, telomere length equilibrium. 
And then when we look at what happens with the phenotypes in these mice, if you look at the um, aberrant uh, testes tubules, I showed you that the heterozygous mice uh, have aberrant tubules, the uh, wild type five star mice do, but then now when you breed uh, these back and restore uh, the telomere length, uh, you find that the, uh, the testes tubules come back uh, to normal. So the phenotypes go with the, uh, the telomere length. So we've been very interested in these uh, questions of what are uh, the role um, of telomerase uh, in disease uh, and how the, um, the telomerase RNA and the, uh, the protein component contribute to this um, genetic anticipation that is seen in this inherited uh, syndrome. Uh, in the last uh, few years, there have been uh, suggestions from um, a, a number of different groups uh, that indicate that the protein component of telomerase may have additional roles uh, besides the telomere elongation role that I've been talking to you about. Uh, and this comes from overexpression studies that suggest that this protein component uh, has telomere length independent functions. Uh, in one study, uh, it was found that the, uh, the TERT component uh, regulates chromatin and the DNA damage response. Uh, in another, it was uh, pr proposed that overexpression of TERT uh, promotes uh, cell proliferation uh, and WNT-related -rela uh, gene transcription. Uh, and here is another study uh, indicating that the uh, overexpression of TERT uh, modulates uh, the WNT signaling pathway. Now, we thought it was very important to understand uh, if there is a, a secondary role of telomerase, uh, because in these families that have mutations in telomerase, we would want to know about those other roles uh, that telomerase may play that are independent um, of telomere length. And so, um, although these were overexpression studies, we decided that we wanted to look now in the protein component knockout um, and ask what happens in the setting of knocking out the protein component. Would we see different phenotypes that would have to do with these uh, telomere length uh, independent roles of telomerase? So one of the first things we did was a uh, gene expression array. Um, and we are using now here the uh, black six mice that have very, very long telomeres, where we see no phenotype at all uh, in the first generation mice uh, with the long telomeres. Uh, and this is simply um, looking at uh, the TERT knockout G1 mouse gene expression compared uh, to wild type. Um, and what you uh, are looking at is uh, what's called a volcano plot, where we are averaging uh, a number of biological replicates. Uh, and so uh, these are the, um, the normal uh, levels of gene expression. And anything that would be uh, different between the G1 and the wild type uh, would be uh, found uh, in these quadrants here in terms of outliers. So in both the case of knocking out the RNA component or knocking out the protein component, uh, we found uh, no change in the gene expression profile uh, in the knockout setting. Uh, and we specifically looked um, at Wnt uh, signaling pathway genes, and they are in here, but they are not uh, altered. We also looked directly um, at the DNA damage response. Uh, so we took uh, mice that were either knocked out for the RNA component or knocked out uh, for the protein component. These are first generation mice. Uh, and we either uh, didn't irradiate them or irradiated them with 5 gray and looked at the induction of the DNA damage response. This is phospho P53. Uh, and you can see a nice uh, induction of the DNA damage response here. Uh, and the same thing occurs here in these uh, TERT knockout mice. And when we quantitated uh, the, the number of um, the um, amount of P53 uh, induction in either no irradiation or the 5 gray irradiation, we found no significant uh, changes in either the RNA component knockout or uh, the protein component knockout. So then we wanted to ask um, a little bit more of a subtle question, which was, um, if we don't see any uh, changes in gene expression or changes in the DNA damage response, maybe we would see something uh, at the level of the phenotype of the mouse. So what we've done now is to take uh, the protein component knockout mouse, this TERT component knockout mouse, and back cross it for seven generations onto this castaneous background where we can see very nice phenotypes uh, in this particular genetic background. Uh, and we can look now um, at the heterozygous mice. Uh, we can look at the, uh, the null mice um, as well. So we can compare what we see in the RNA component knockout to what we see in the protein component knockout. So uh, here's the RNA component and the protein component. Uh, and when we look at the telomere length, Again, I'm showing you here the wild type telomere length versus the RNA component knockout in the first generation Castaneous, uh, the wild type versus the protein component. There's very similar uh, levels of telomere shortening in both the RNA and protein component knockouts. When we ask the question about haploinsufficiency, um, 
We can look at telomere length in the wild type and the protein component null. Here's the wild type distribution, the null. And when we look at two independent heterozygotes now, so these are um, heterozygotes for the protein component, the telomere length is intermediate, indicating that there's clearly haploinsufficiency for the protein component as well as for the RNA component. And uh, we're still early days in really analyzing this colony that we've been uh, developing for the past few years. Uh, but we can already uh, clearly see that if we look at uh, survival, uh, these are the uh, wild type mice shown here, the survival uh, curve in our colony. And when you look at knockouts from first generation parrots versus knockouts from second generation parents, you can see uh, that there's a decrease uh, in the survival in these protein component knockouts. Uh, so we can now look at some of the phenotypes uh, in these mice. One of the phenotypes uh, that we've been able to look at, both in the castaneous mice as well as in the black six mice, um, is uh, the uh, skeletal, skeletal development. Uh, the wind signaling pathway is known to be involved in skeletal development, uh, and it's been suggested that the number of ribs uh, that may be um, apparent uh, in this kind of an x-ray uh, may be altered if the wind signaling pathway um, is altered. Um, however, in uh, the black six case, looking either at wild type or uh, the null for the tert, or in the castaneous genetic background, looking at wild type or a number of null animals, we haven't yet seen any uh, disruptions to the uh, wind signaling pathway. So the pathology that we do see uh, in the tert knockout mice, in the testes, we see empty seminiferous tubules, just like we saw in the RNA component knockout. We see the intestinal epithelium. We see villus atrophy. Uh, there's something called extramedullary hematopoiesis, and this is when uh, there is bone marrow failure and hematopoiesis starts happening uh, in the liver, spleen, uh, and other organs. Uh, and as I showed you, there's decreased survival with increasing generations. So our analysis uh, so far of this colony is that the phenotype of the RNA component and the protein component knockout mice is similar, indicating again that short telomeres are the things that are be causing uh, these phenotypes. And again, this is important to know from the clinical setting in terms of what diseases you might be anticipating in families uh, that have these inherited mutations. So now just to, to finish up, um, I just wanted to point out that many of the phenotypes from these syndromes of telomere shortening um, share features of age-related disease. So I've told you about uh, dyskeratosis congenita. It turns out that there are a number of other diseases that are associated in these families uh, that have short telomeres. So uh, there is inherited uh, bone marrow failure or familial aplastic anemia, uh, immune senescence, chemotherapy intolerance. Uh, there's a uh, significant rate of pulmonary fibrosis, liver disease, and increased cancer incidence. Uh, so these are all things that are seen in these families that have these inherited syndromes of insufficient telomerase uh, and telomere shortening. Um, as in many cases uh, where you have a particular genetic disease, uh, that genetic disease will give you uh, the strongest case in terms of the phenotype, but you may find that those pathways that are disrupted um, are present uh, in, in other individuals. Um, and so uh, we think that by, by studying these families that have uh, insufficient telomerase, it may tell us um, about what happens in individuals that have short telomeres even when they have normal wild type telomerase. So it implies that short telomeres play a role uh, in certain human age related diseases uh, without frank telomerase mutations. And these are all situations where there are tissues um, of high turnover. So I just want to leave you with this, uh, this slide here, um, which shows the uh, very wide distribution um, of telomere lengths in the human population. Um, it's been known uh, for some time that if you look at uh, telomere length uh, in humans uh, versus age, and this is in uh, total leukocytes, so normal white blood cells, that there's a, a progressive decline uh, in telomere length in age. Uh, and this, we think, has to do with the fact that there's limiting amount of telomerase in cells. And so the number of cell divisions that occur over the lifetime of an individual in the hematopoietic system outstrips the ability of the telomerase, which is clearly active in these cells, uh, but it's not enough telomerase to be able to keep elongating these telomeres. But the point I want to make about this slide is the huge amount of heterogeneity uh, in the human population in terms of telomere length, uh, that there is a very wide distribution. Uh, and what we are focusing on is uh, the particular uh, subset um, of individuals which may have a variety of different genetic inputs 
as well as environmental inputs, because we're talking about tissues of high turnover, where there's a lot of cell division. So any situation where you may have an insult, uh, for instance, uh, to the uh, immune system, and you have to divide more times, that's going to cause more telomere shortening. So it's a combined um, effect of both uh, the genetic uh, initial telomere length, as well as the environmental history, uh, that may put uh, individuals with shorter telomeres at a higher risk for certain of these age-associated uh, degenerative diseases. So the combined effect of initial telomere length and environmental history could contribute uh, to uh, these age-related diseases. So just uh, to summarize what I've told you, I've told you that telomerase is essential for telomere maintenance. Telomere shortening leads to cell death or senescence after many cell divisions. Short telomeres inhibit tumor growth through either apoptosis or senescence. Uh, and this suggests that telomerase inhibitors may be effective in certain kinds of cancer therapy. I've shown you that haploinsufficiency for telomerase causes telomere shortening. Short telomeres limit cell growth even in the presence of telomerase. Short telomeres may limit the long-term cell division potential. Inheritance of short telomeres causes phenotype even in wild-type animals, and these are our wild-type star or so-called occult genetic disease. Short telomeres may cause loss of tissue renewal in normal aging population. Telomere lengths may predict the onset of certain age-related disease. And I just want to uh, give credit to uh, the people in my life, in my life, yes, also in my life, in my lab, sorry, in my life, uh, who've done all of these experiments. Uh, David Felzer did the experiments with the uh, emu mick mice, uh, showing the uh, both senescence and apoptosis in the cancer cells. Uh, Margaret Strong has bred all of the castaneous mice. Um, and uh, Tammy Morris is working uh, with the mice, the emu mick mice, to understand the role of uh, telomere dysfunction. And our collaborators uh, at Hopkins, uh, Mary Armanios, uh, has a lab in the oncology department uh, and in pathology uh, to look at the uh, effects of the um, uh, absence of telomerase. We collaborate with uh, Buck Karam and David Huso. So I'll stop there. Thanks. I'm sure Carol will take a few questions, but people will go to microphones. We have microphone in each of the aisles. Congratulations for pioneering work. So is there a difference in the telomere length in different tissues? Obviously, uh, this is an issue mainly for the brain and other issues where the turnover of the cells is very low. Yes, um, there are clearly in, in situations where it's been looked at uh, closely. If you just look at different tissues in mice, you can find that there are different telomere lengths. Um, another question, though, might be uh, what is the rate of telomere shortening in different tissues? Is it the same rate of telomere shortening? And we don't know that there may not be tissue-specific uh, amounts of shortening per cell division. Um, and also, what is the um, set point at which a short telomere causes these phenotypes? These are very important questions that we really haven't had um, a chance to get at, but I think that they're going to be essential to ask questions about some of these um, uh, disease uh, situations. For the same cell type, you have stem cell as well as differentiated cells. Is there any way to see the difference in those two groups? For the same cell type? Um, so we haven't specifically taken um, a stem cell to ask, does the stem cell have longer telomeres uh, than the immediate differentiation partners? We've looked in a more uh, sort of uh, gross way at um, the progressive loss uh, through different generations. Uh, one of the things about these, these assays is that um, there is such heterogeneity in telomere length uh, because what happens is there's a little bit of shortening, a little bit of lengthening, a little bit of shortening. Um, and so to get a precise measurement um, is fairly difficult. So you have to have fairly large differences uh, to see um, a change. Thank you. 
As we get closer to uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, have you had a chance to look at what the telomeres look like in the induced pluripotent stem cells? And I guess the real question is, is there a way after the telomeres have undergone shortening during some of these generational shortening events, can they be re-elongated? Re yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And there have been a, have been a couple of papers that have published looking um, at iPS cells. Um, but I, I think that the, you have it exactly right, which is um, what will actually happen if they start off with short telomeres. And one of the things that, that we've found is that um, it certainly takes a, a large number of generations to reestablish a wild type uh, telomere length. So um, I think that it's something that people should be paying attention to. Um, because uh, if you start off with something that has short telomeres, you can't assume that as soon as you put it into a wild type setting uh, with normal levels of telomerase, that the telomeres will then be reestablished back up to the, the correct level. So I think that that's very important uh, that over a period of time, you may expect it to be reestablished at the correct equilibrium, uh, but it won't necessarily be that right away. So I think that nobody is really taking um, a look at the telomere length in the cells that they're looking at, and it could be very highly variable. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, I had, is there a, um, a point of no return in the shortening of the telomeres? Because uh, the wild type mice you get from head head matings still have short telomeres, which means that the presence of normal levels of telomerase is not enough to rescue this phenotype. Right. So is there any? That is known on that? Well, in, in these studies, we're, certain, we're starting with mice that are already alive and are at the level where they can, um, can reproduce. Um, certainly, what we would expect is that when a telomere gets to be too short and it's signaling this DNA damage response, um, that at some point, those cells won't survive anymore. Uh, we, we do know that there is a signaling mechanism by which the short telomeres specifically recruit telomerase. So uh, the shortest telomere gets re-elongated much more efficiently than a medium-length telomere does. So there are you know, inherent uh, rescue mechanisms built into the uh, feedback system in terms of the telomere length maintenance. But I can't really address uh, that question because we're dealing with the, the animals that have to at least still be breeding in order to, to do that experiment. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Um, I've read that uh, stress or depression or uh, cardiovascular disease or lots of things can cause shortening. And I just wondered if you could expand a little on your last point that you made about there's a genetic starting point and then there's other things in the environment. And I think we maybe think of environment uh, in certain ways, but maybe we should be thinking in other ways about environment and telomeres. Yeah, I think that there's, um you know, a large number of things that one can think about that may uh, contribute to telomere shortening. We've really been taking initially uh, the genetic approach and asking in these families, what sort of diseases do you see and what do we see in the mice so that we can get a question about cause and effect and then we can put telomerase back and know whether or not it was really the short telomeres that caused that. There certainly is a, a large literature of correlation of things that correlate with telomere length, but as we know, things that correlate aren't always causative. So. Um, so I think that the, that the door is really open for um, a number of, of different diseases, but we'd like to take the genetic approach and really ask the question to, to ask the causality uh, kind of question. Um, but I really think it's a tip of the iceberg if you start thinking about the, the number of um, age-related diseases uh, that may have to do with tissue turnover. And I think that using this genetic approach will get us to know more of those uh, diseases that are gonna be associated with telomere shortening. Any thoughts on what the mechanism is that's sensing tel uh, tel telomere equilibrium and what's gone so haywire in C57 black six mice in particular? Um, so do we know about the mechanism that senses short telomeres? Uh, no, we don't, but we do know that it's the short telomeres, not the telomere length equilibrium. We are able to do a genetic cross where we can bring in just a few short telomeres and those mice have the phenotype uh, and it's not relative to average telomere length. So again, that what brings us back to the DNA damage response, that the short telomeres actually trigger something. Uh, it, and it's not measuring, for instance, you could imagine it was measuring telomere binding protein and the amount of telomere binding protein that was floating around. And then it would be average telomere length that would be causing the, um, the effect. Now, why the black six mice have such long telomeres really uh, is a mystery to me. We actually looked at a number of uh, recently derived wild mice. We actually caught wild mice and we got from www.wildmice.com, wild mice. 
And they have telomere lengths that are very similar to humans. So you will hear people say, oh, mice, you don't pay attention to them. Their telomeres are so long. That's um, 129, black 6, DBA. Those laboratory strains that people tend to use have these long telomeres. And my only conclusion is they've lost their normal telomere length equilibrium. And somehow the telomeres have been allowed to get long under whatever breeding conditions they were bred under. I think that's very interesting. Uh, but clearly, the normal established wild type telomere length is, is a very uh, tight, uh, tight telomere length. And you know, uh, in order to get at those uh, genetic components, if they are genetic components, you would need to do a very large uh, breeding. And we haven't really been able to you know, follow that uh, QTL analysis to, to ask about the differences. But I think that it would be an interesting, an interesting question. OK, well, once again, I want to thank Carol. And one thing you did, I forgot to mention in my introduction, this is actually the first seminar she's given since giving, getting the Nobel Prize, which is really pretty special that this all worked out. And as a small token of our appreciation, we would like to share with her um, this uh, small gift that we give to each of our, our lecturers each year. And Kathy, if you'll come up on stage, we're just going to do one photo op, and then we're all done.